So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Book Club of California's online program titled California and Reframing the Making of a Modern U.S. West. And thank you for joining us uh, for this Book Club of California presentation. We haven't had a, a virtual only presentation in a while, so we're glad that you could join us. My name is Kevin Kosick, and I'm the executive director of the Book Club of California. It's my pleasure to welcome you and host the webinar this evening. For those of you that might be new to the Book Club of California, we are a nonprofit member and donor supported organization dedicated to preserving and promoting the history of the book and the book arts. Oftentimes we do that with a focus on the literature and the history of California and the West, like we are doing this evening. Uh, the book club publishes limited edition books, a scholarly journal, and keepsakes. We host a year-round series of exhibitions and programs like the one this evening on topics including fine printing, design, typography, bookbinding, collecting, California history, and much, much more. Now, if you're not a member of the book club or if your membership has lapsed and you're interested in what we do, please consider joining our century-long tradition. Our membership dues are modest and the benefits are many, and we simply can't do the work of the book club without the support of our members. So I encourage you to visit us online at bccbooks.org to join or to donate to the book club. And now for tonight's program and our presenter. The program is titled California and Reframing the Making of a Modern U.S. West. And it's by author and professor of history at Duke University, Sarah Deutsch. Now, Sarah Deutsch studied history at Yale University and Oxford University. She has been a professor of history at Duke University since 2004. She has served as Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences at Duke, as chair of the history department of Duke as well. She has also served as program co-chair for annual conferences of the American Studies Association and the American of oh, the Organization of American Historians, as well as chair of the executive committee of the delegates of the ACLS and on the executive committee of the OAH, again, Organization of American Historians. Now, Making a Modern U.S. West is her fourth book. While her books cover a wide a, a geographic range, they all represent her intense interest in gender, racial and spatial formations, and how marginalized people mobilize to shift the ground of their daily life. Now, in addition to writing on the U.S. West, she has written on urban history in Boston, and she has written numerous articles, like I said earlier, on things like gender, spatial formations, and urban history. Now, tonight, Sarah will talk about some of the central themes in her book, Making a Modern U.S. West, including the question of what constitutes a modern U.S. and whose vision defines the West and the nation. And of course, there'll be multiple references to the elements specific to us here in California. Now, in terms of logistics for this evening, we will have a presentation and then we'll follow that with a Q&A session. If you have questions or comments for our presenter or about the presentation, please use the chat and the Q&A functions in Zoom. We should have time toward the end of the hour to take questions, and we'll do that from the chat and the Q&A. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Sarah Deutsch. Thank you so much, Kevin. And thanks to the book club um, California members who invited me to chat with you about the book. And I'm honored to be here and so pleased to have the opportunity to share some of the book's content and ideas with you and hopefully to hear your thoughts on the subject. It's not a short book. Um, I meant to have a ruler with this, but I don't have one, but you can tell that it's not a short book. And uh, it's not as long as it looks, about a third of that is footnotes and bibliography, but even leaving out the bibliography and the notes and even though I tend to talk fast, I think even at full speed, I couldn't narrate the whole text in the 40 minutes allotted here. Those of you who are old enough to remember Monty Python might recall their summarizing Proust contest in which uh, the winner, a barbershop quartet, harmonized the single line, it's about love. 
My book, I'm sorry to say, is not about love, but it is about how different groups of people imagined the future of the U.S. West differently and worked to make that imagined U.S. West a reality. These groups, of course, didn't all agree. So the central theme of the book, or one central theme, is the question of what would constitute a modern U.S. and whose vision would define the West and the nation. Now, for some, modernity meant corporate consolidation, capital-intensive agriculture, white supremacy, male-headed households, and private individual landholding. For others, modernity could include racial mixing, transnational mobility, economic democracy, and collective ownership of land. Californians ran the full spectrum of these ideas. They fought over redwoods and irrigation. They speculated on land and oil. They fought over the border and who belonged on which side. They fought about racing and drinking and even over who should get a say in all those things. And in doing so, they helped define modernity for the region and the nation. The book proceeds in four sections, one for each decade. The first section addresses early 20th century obsessions with demarcating, with drawing distinctions in every direction between the human and natural world. And in the West, particularly this affected irrigation schemes and who national parks were really supposed to refresh. Between nations, it's in this decade that for the first time, we begin to keep land-based immigration records. Between distinctions between sexes and between what they would define as races, which I'll come back to shortly. The second section follows the refusal of people to fall neatly into line with those demarcations, including the movements for radical democracy at the polls and the workplace. This is the nonpartisan league, which I fell in love with when I started this book. Um, alliances between women fighting to get the ballot, socialists, labor organizers, and revolutionaries were all fighting for a democratic expansion. And here I would say that the impact of the Mexican Revolution on the US West doesn't usually get nearly enough attention. Um, it does in this book. That section ends with World War I and the massive repression and vigilante action that flowed from it. The third section details the rerouting of that democratic impulse into a search for economic democracy through a state-facilitated orgy of speculation in land, oil, and tourism, as well as Hollywood. That section has some of the funnier moments in the book. But that decade also ends with an implosion. And the final section deals with the mobilizations that flowed from economic collapse, including the bonus marchers, oops, mass deportation of Mexicans and their US citizen children, general strikes, and the New Deal attempt to restore order by moving people and animals. In a sense, the book is bookended by Roosevelt, though I talk more about Lyndon Johnson, this is what he looked like in the 1930s, um, in the conclusion than about Franklin Roosevelt. Out of the book's many themes and ideas, I'm gonna focus on just three things in this talk. First, that racial categories are inconsistent and unstable, but having them at all seemed essential to claiming to be a modern US state. Second, that our modern agricultural system has its roots in this period with all the implications for ideas about race and citizenship. And third, that when women come onto the political stage, surprising things happen and not everyone is happy about it. So I'm gonna start with racial categories. Inventing categories and categorizing people by race was just one of many ways the state was trying to exert control over its territory and people by creating boundaries and borders. Now, a lot of us think of the ways the US thinks about race as a story of the US South, a history of slavery and segregation that left us with a population divided into two races, black and white. But the U.S. West played its own complicated and central role in that national story, one that blurred and multiplied boundaries. One of my fundamental questions when I began researching this volume was what would happen if we took seriously that Brown versus the Board of Education, that desegregated schools, that was a Kansas case. A hundred years after struggles over enslaving black people earned the territory the moniker Bleeding Kansas. In 1909, a foreman in Emporia, Kansas claimed, this is a quote, the color line is being strictly drawn. Strictly drawn, but where? In much of the US, Jim Crow made the key question, who is black? But in the West, the question was more, who is white? People of Mexican descent had citizenship rights by treaty, but their racial status evaded consensus. Before 1910, some 420 Japanese immigrants had succeeded in being naturalized as citizens as white. 
The 1906 Act enabled Filipinos to do so. The local courts often refused, saying they were neither Black nor white. I chose to start this volume with the Spanish-American War because in the US, that modern era of demarcating peoples began with the US's imperial adventure in 1898. Now, I don't know about you, but I learned virtually nothing about the war in school. Certainly not that we still have as colonies territories we acquired and with and shortly after that war. When it was talked about at all in school, it was posed as just a continuation of the long history of US expansion. But there were key differences that matter in this book. Most important among those differences is how the US decided to deal with the people in the newly acquired territories. Between 1898 and 1900, the US annexed Hawaii, gained the Philippines, Guam, Puerto Rico, and American Samoa. How would we think about the people in those territories? And this is one of those places where it becomes clear that racial categories are invented, inconsistent, and unstable. Look at these 1898 cartoons. While the only categories in the cartoons are black and white, sometimes the people is cast as white and the same people are cast as black. When I was researching the book, looking at government reports on immigration in the first decade of the 20th century, I was struck with the variability of who was considered white and who was considered something else. In 1901, a federal industrial commission report revealed a host of contradictory racialized hierarchies on Western railroads. But what struck me even more than the variability was that it didn't bother the government investigators. The only thing that bothered them was when the mines or the railroads or other enterprises didn't categorize people by race at all. In 1901, the Industrial Commission on Immigration reported to the US House of Representatives. It declared the most important improvement since 1893 in the method of compiling statistics of immigration was introduced in 1899, just a year after the Spanish-American War. And this, and you see this quote, when instead of pre the preceding classification of immigrants according to the countries or political divisions from which they came, they were classified according to the races to which they belonged. And the US leaned deeply into the notion that races trumped citizenship, politics, nation borders, whatever. And why does all this matter? For the first time after the Spanish-American War, the US gained territory with no intent fully to incorporate the territory or its inhabitants as citizens and participants in the US Republic. The US created a nation-based empire and that creation required a new logic around who could belong to the nation part of the empire, a new logic around the borders of citizenship, around what made an American an American. The potentially destabilizing effects were immediately clear even before the war. In 1897, a Texas district court challenged Ricardo Rodriguez's citizenship status. It noted that, quote, as to color, Rodriguez may be classed with the copper colored or red men, meaning on no grounds for citizenship in the black and white of the law. His citizenship was saved only by stipulations in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that ended the Mexican American War and guaranteed the citizenship of Mexicans who found themselves now living in the US but that it could be challenged at all in the 1890s marked the strength of the new racial project. Treaty-based citizenship made Mexican descent people anomalous members of the new polity. In the new system, they could simultaneously be inside and outside the polity, inside by treaty, outside by race. People of Mexican descent, in other words, whatever their citizenship, were seen as alien to the national body. And that will become important when we talk about our agricultural system. Mexican officially became a race in the 1930 census at a time when city, state, and federal officials were rounding up anyone they saw as Mexican and deporting. This new way of demarcating also required a convenient set of fictions. In a 1901 Supreme Court case dealing with precisely this issue, Justice Henry Billings Brown, writing for the majority, erased the prior residence and continued existence of Blacks, Mexicans, and Asians. He claimed that the continental US was, quote, inhabited only by people of the same race or scattered bodies of native Indians. That fiction that everyone in the continental US was white made it possible for him to pose new territories as representing a new case. 
separated by, quote, differences of race, habits, laws, and customs, and so didn't need to be incorporated in the same way. No one could better join the symbolic content of the West and empire than Teddy Roosevelt. He made his reputation writing up his dude ranch experience in the 1880s and leading the charge on San Juan Hill during the Spanish-American War. In a book review, he wrote that the 19th century demands no more complete vindication for its existence than the fact that it has kept for the white race the best portions of the New World service, temperate America and Australia. So now I'm gonna to turn to the agricultural system and you'll see that these things are connected. Another of my questions when starting research on this volume was what if the mass Mexican migration had happened before the Mexican revolution? But, oh wait, it did happen before the revolution. It's just that no one cared. The US didn't even keep records on land-based immigration as opposed to people coming through coastal ports until 1908. The tiny set of officials who policed the enormous land border were only looking for Chinese crossings. The border patrol would only be created in 1924. As early as 1901, government investigators were startled by the scale of Mexican immigration and the dependence of key sectors of the US economy on Mexicans and Mexican Americans. But the authors of the report devoted one paragraph of their 800 page report, one paragraph to what they called Mexican peon labor. Nine years later, another immigration commission expanded their treatment to a whole nine pages out of their two volumes of abstracts. They complained about the lack of record keeping and noted a rapid rise in Mexican immigration between 1899 and 1909. They found Mexicans didn't provoke as much oppositions as the Chinese, but they found them slow to assimilate and quote, less desirable as a citizen than as a laborer. Unlike in the earlier reports, there was now no recognition of a substantial Mexican descent US citizenry. When the US did start keeping records on land-based immigration, it still wasn't about Mexicans. Instead, it was a deal with the Canadians as a result of the Canadian and US gentlemen's agreement with Japan. It was about contract laborers smuggling in Japanese migrants, not Mexicans. President Roosevelt meeting with politicians from British Columbia told them, well, we have got to build up our Western country with our white civilization. Now, it was no accident that Mexican immigration had risen. Under Mexican President Porfirio Diaz and US presidents who identified as progressive, international capital funded the building of railroads and mines and developed ranches and farms that drew on a labor force that freely crossed national boundaries. In both the US and Mexico, the large scale accumulation of land came at the expense of communal and small landholders. As large landholders dispossessed communal and smallholders, those dispossessed people had to find work. And it was all one system. To give one example, the Alamo Canal had begun irrigating a large fertile but arid valley in California called the Colorado Desert. The temperature there could reach 120 degrees Fahrenheit. The developer who engineered the canal cleverly renamed the area to make it more appealing. He called it instead the Imperial Valley, which you may know. The name change and the canal helped the desolate spot draw 2,000 settlers in only eight months. The canal, like the Alamo River, flowed north across the US-Mexico border. In exchange for permitting the intake, Mexico demanded the right to take up to half the water from the river. As the population rose on both sides of the border, the California residents found themselves rationing water. And even though the water was supposed to be for agricultural and domestic work, farmers found dead horses and even occasionally dead humans floating in the canal. Settlers on the US side began to demand an all American canal, one completely on the US side of the border. But in many ways, it was already all American. 840,000 acres of the Mexican land belonged to a Los Angeles syndicate that included Harry Chandler, son-in-law of Harrison Gray Otis, soon to be publisher of the LA Times. This wasn't a unique situation. International financial syndicates from Europe and the US built empires in the American West, including like the Alamo Canal, crossing borders that seemed to exist only on maps. By 1910, US citizens owned over a quarter of Mexico's land. 160 US citizens owned at least 100,000 acres each totaling 90 million acres of agricultural ranch mining and timberlands. Now the Americans who owned the land along the Alamo Canal in Mexico 
recruited Chinese immigrant labor, which was still legal in Mexico, for the cotton fields in Mexico. That meant the Mexicans they displaced had to find work elsewhere, conveniently, for example, on the land these Americans owned on the US side of the border. So it was one system. But irrigated agriculture had other issues. Those creating it drastically underestimated the power of the national, natural world to flout human arrogance. The California Development Company and railroad mogul Edward Harriman Southern Pacific Railroad utterly failed in their attempts to control the Colorado River in the Imperial Valley. Sorry. Even beyond the trickiness of transnational negotiations over the river's contents, recurrent floods washed away jetties and dams. One flood in 1905, you see this picture in 1906, breached the riverbank creating a 400 square mile inland sea with 40 foot high waterfalls. In response, 2000 largely conscripted Native Americans from six tribes built a rock dam that failed. Next, 3000 railroad cars spent two weeks carrying and dumping 5,765 loads of rock into the chasm. The river breached that wall in 1907. As tensions rose between the Mexican and US users of the Colorado River, between local users and the company, between the company and the Federal Bureau of Reclamation, President Theodore Roosevelt became ever more furious at the company's machinations. Congress resisted bailing out a private company, leaving the settlers literally on uncertain ground as the Mexican Revolution began. Now, as many of you know, um, entrepreneurial privately financed irrigation schemes were not new to California in the 20th century. The late 19th century had seen spectacular successes in the San Joaquin Valley and around present day Pasadena, but not all schemes fared so well. Even with federal funding and expertise, and even in California, state-sponsored attempts fell victim to insufficient funds and personnel, laws and knowledge, the lack of it, and to thorny legal issues around water distribution and to spectacularly over-promising available water. In addition, riverbeds shifted, droughts persisted, canals and reservoirs seeped and leaked into forest rock and soil, turning fields into swamps, and states, states and nations argued over water rights. Irrigation was incredibly expensive. And over the next three decades, projects routinely underestimated costs leaving settlers stunned by payments they had no possibility of meeting. But as land suited to farming without irrigation was rapidly disappearing in the early 20th century, while labor unrest rose, US policymakers leaned heavily into large scale irrigation projects as a cure for all social ills. They imagined irrigation would create a democracy of smallholders and end surplus labor, low wages, degraded workers strikes, unemployment and general unrest. Both major political parties fell in line. It was clear from the start who was supposed to benefit from irrigation. It was not supposed to save what was seen as a dying race of Native Americans, for example, or Mexican smallholders. To give just one example, in 1910, a booster of the irrigated Rogue River Valley in Medford, Oregon, bragged that it, quote, is distinctly an American settlement of the best class. There are no colonies of Japanese, Chinese, Hindus, or Negroes to lower the standard of living and of American civilization. But irrigated farming is not only incredibly expensive, it's incredibly labor intensive. In every one of these decades, family farmers who fled dry farming and lucked into irrigation projects were shocked at how much labor it required, and they weren't happy about it. Those Mexican workers set loose by dispossession seemed like a promising antidote to the outsized labor requirements, but they didn't always play along. The IWW in the US and the Mexican Liberal Party in Mexico were founded in the same year cross-border border migrant workers organized. Other US unions promised, quote, a white man's camp, unquote, but the IWW consistently included Asians and created spaces where anti-colonial movements converged with revolutionary movements. Indian nationalists, Filipino insurgents, Mexican revolutionaries mingled in the lumber camps of the Pacific Northwest and in the fields of California. By 1913, they had participated in a series of strikes across California culminating in Wheatland. In, Wheatland's California hop, in Wheatland, California's hop fields, 2,800 job seekers converged, about half women and children that you see here, over half were non-citizens and included 27 nationalities. The growers kept conditions con intentionally bad. They hoped the workers would leave early and forfeit the wages they had withheld. When workers organized, 
the district attorney, who was also the grower's attorney, um, when the workers held a mass meeting, the district attorney arrived with a sheriff and posse. And in the resulting violence, the DA, deputy sheriff, and two workers were killed. Local authorities were convinced it was revolution spread from Mexico. With swift brutality and hundreds of arrests, they did disperse the workers. The episode did lead to the creation of the California Commission on Immigration and Housing, which hoped to improve conditions and turn immigrant workers from revolution. But while it did expose horrific, horrific conditions, it led to very little action. By 1914, there were 75,000 migrant farm workers in California working on ranches without even the kind of accommodations provided for livestock. World War I shifted the ground of the agricultural labor issue. When the U.S. entered the war, Mexican nationals fearing conscription went home. Immigration from everywhere fell dramatically. In the name of patriotism, employers and state officials sent schoolboys, patriotic women, Chinese former sex workers now living in Presbyterian missions, and wards of the state into the field. Employers claimed that these new workers enjoyed the outdoor life, that they toasted marshmallows and sang songs. Maybe they for sure didn't join the IWW, but those patriotic women, the California Division of Women's Land Army, did begin to make demands, including an eight hour day, overtime, and camp inspection. What the growers really wanted was a controllable, vulnerable, limitless labor force that had no roots in the community, unlike the Women's Land Army, and wouldn't organize in unions like their polyglot pre war workers. When a new immigration act, 1917, included a literacy test and a doubled head tax, it threatened to make the labor supply even worse. It threatened to halt the dwindling immigration of impoverished and largely illiterate Mexicans. Farmers said their harvest would be lost. Railroad employers claimed that tracks would fall into disrepair and troop uh, movements and supply movements would fail. As a result, the US federal government negotiated its first guest worker program with Mexico. Government temporarily exempted and theoretically regulated numbers, Mexican agriculture of labor from the head tax and literacy test, and even older contract labor provisions. In return, employers guaranteed to match prevailing wage, wage, wage rates and return the theoretically carefully monitored exempted labor to Mexico within the year. Now, as you know, just a few years before, California had experienced massive agricultural labor unrest and then similar unrest in mining and elsewhere. In this context, really any context, the prospect of unlimited number of extremely vulnerable workers under restrictive contracts had great appeal to employers and they proved loath to give it up after the war. Indeed, the number of Mexicans entering under the exemptions for agricultural labor increased over 100% in the first year after the war and continued to grow. Moreover, of those legally admitted under the program, only about a third had returned as promised to Mexico. Advocates of continued exemptions justify their advocacy by hewing to the line that Mexicans disappeared below the border when they weren't needed, despite all the evidence to the contrary. But the issue was not only about the labor supply, it was about who got to participate in the American dream. The US had been struggling for decades with how to keep people on the farm how to sustain the small farmer as the backbone of democracy and keep small farmers conservative instead of rural insurgents. You have this idealized picture of the yeoman farmer. Sorry, my, there. The huge gap in the standard of living between farms and towns drove people away. All the heroes of the age, Herbert Hoover, Henry Ford, Charles Lindbergh had fled the farm. We have got beyond soiling our hands, the Texas cotton farmer said at one of the congressional hearings, and we want somebody else to do the real work. He challenged the congressman. Do any of you want to give up your place as members of this committee and go back and soil your hands in the dirt? Because education, witnesses insisted, ruined demand for common labor. Raising the standard of living on the farm required low-cost labor that would never be part of the community and the school system. Only a perpetually migrant labor force, one that could be excluded from the benefits of local community, would serve the purpose. It would boost the income and diminish the manual labor of the farmer and his family, allowing them to afford running water, cars, a Victrola, and at the same time, it would exclude the poorer class in the vicinity from the Anglo community. They couldn't belong, they couldn't vote. 
almost as though to prove the efficacy of a permanent migrant laboring class when the war boom finally ended in early 1921 and unemployment reached the highest level in US history to that point, at least 150,000 Mexicans returned home. In March, the Secretary of Labor rescinded the exemptions. Federal officials tracked and deported those they could find of the immigrants who had slipped out of their contracts. But this post-World War I depression was just an ill-fitting prelude to the economic expansion of the 20s. The renewed expansion would not be hindered by the lack of overt government permission for the importation of Mexican labor. There was new, no new guest worker program, but the government had also failed to appropriate money to restore the wartime policing of the border. Without this border patrol, as one inspector put it, quote, practically any alien desirous of entering the US and possessed of ordinary intelligence and persistence could readily find the means of doing so without fear of detection. By 1923, Mexican immigration, largely undocumented now, surpassed its wartime rate. When the Border Patrol was finally created in 1924, it had only a small fraction of the size and resources of the wartime force. And even those officers were more inclined to control Mexican immigrants than deport them. In 1925, for example, the Border Patrol hired more agents and started detaining Mexican immigrants in the Imperial Valley. The farmers who hired the immigrants called it harassment and petitioned Congress to stop. Instead, the Border Patrol and the growers worked together. The Imperial Valley Chamber of Commerce and the local Border Patrol chief set up a labor bureau, capturing undocumented Mexicans and letting them stay if they paid the $18 immigration fee in four installments at local banks and then took the literacy test. They registered 3,000 people in two months and over 6,000 the following year, releasing them to employers despite the lack of any labor shortage. So they had eyes on undocumented workers they could deport at any time, at any site of organizing or protest, and the growers got their labor at a price that they wanted. The Border Patrol, a federal agency in this way, supplied the growers with extremely vulnerable workers in unlimited numbers. Low-wage vulnerable labor would only become more vital to U.S. agriculture in succeeding decades. 20 years after the Newlands Act of 1902, the borrowers on its irrigation projects had repaid only 10% of the no-interest loans, and 60% of irrigators were in default. Things would not get better. The 1920s were not a great time for most farmers. Such farming required, as California Senator Hiram Johnson admitted, what we used to call squatting occupations. With a circulating labor force in California alone, of possibly 80,000 Mexicans. As they had in the 1920 hearings and later hearings, those demanding low cost labor depicted the Mexicans as uniquely suited for it. Quote, whether in the providence of God he has been so constituted, one former congressman declared, I won't say. Another witness claimed the Mexican is a migratory being. The twisted logic of the hearings manifested in the imagined racial formation of the future West. Who was supposed to do what? Mexican migratory patterns were already essential to the migrants' home place survival, and they had become equally essential in the eyes of many Anglos to the maintenance of Western Anglo small farmers' standard of living and to corporate farming profits. Witnesses at hearings claimed the U.S. government had enticed them onto these projects and now needed to provide the labor that would make them profitable. The unarticulated compromise that had emerged from congressional hearings lay in the blind eye of the immigration officials in the admission, however illegally, of permanently marginal laborers. Though those admitted were Mexican, the racial ideology demanded the identification of all those of Mexican descent, whatever their citizenship, as Mexican, while the determination to avoid the recreation, as they put it, of the racial problems of the South demanded the myth that all these Mexicans disappeared below the border each year and were no part of the US polity. A Colorado Congressman in this context expressed his determination to make, quote, this country as much as I can help to make it so a white man's country. This is pretty much the system we still have. All people of Mexican descent become in popular parlance and often in official behavior, Mexicans rather than Americans, no matter what their citizenship is. These others are so essential. We're not outside the boundaries of the US. Whether they were citizens or immigrants, permanent or temporary, they had a necessary place within the US system of capital intensive farming and that the government helped create and finance. This modern agricultural system of capital and labor would generate World War II's guest worker program, the Bracero program, which outlasted the war by decades, 
and its successor special farm worker visas still operative into the 21st century. So now I'm gonna to switch to women in politics in India. This section really has two beginnings. First, in, 18, in 1911, in August, at a slaughterhouse in the small town of Oroville, California, a butcher surprised a man lurking in the shadows. Adolf Kessler tackled the man, convinced he'd been stealing meat for weeks. The tackle man only wore a shirt and he had bits of buckskin threaded through his ears and nose. Kessler thought he was Mexican, but he got no response when he questioned him in Spanish. Kessler phoned the sheriff who took the silent man away. Now, in contrast to the Supreme Court's fiction that we heard about earlier, that this was a homogenous place, Oroville was a small but typically Western town. With fewer than a thousand people, it had the language skills to try Spanish, English, Chinese, and Maidu. In this case, none of it worked. The press went wild, labeling him the last wild Indian. Labeling him the last fit within the paradigm of demarcations of the previous decade. Indians were gone, modern civilization had triumphed. Alfred Kroeber, chair of Berkeley's anthropology department was thrilled. He installed Ishii in the new anthropology museum as a resident, a janitor, and an exhibit. So this is how Ishii preferred to appear, this is Ishii with Kroeber. This is how they insisted on photographing Ishii and he finally gave in, but this is his self-presentation. Because this story of the Indians being gone was the story many Western white people and their government desired. It did not reflect the world around them any more than Ishii's white shirt and canned goods that he had made him a wild Indian rather than someone who avoided the white people who had slaughtered his own people. The story of Indians vanishing and permanently pre-modern didn't reflect either, for example, the successful Teamsters Union formed by Cal California's Concos and Yukiwailaki and white freighters in 1905. In popular imagination and policy, Indians weren't supposed to be participants in the modern West. Those of you who have seen Killers of the Flower Moon have some sense of the price of this fictive exclusion that required, for example, a sage designated as full blood to have guardians who turned out to be incredibly violently predatory. And then in 1917, those disappeared California Indians were being conscripted into the American Expeditionary Force to join the US Army in World War I. And here's where the other stream comes in because newly enfranchised women played a part in what happened next. I'm gonna make a detour and then circle back. The morning after the election of 1920, the town of Young Cala, Oregon woke up to what one newspaper called a feminist revolution. Women had swept the elections. Young Cala had 323 residents, men outnumbered women two to one, and men comfortable in their majority had run the town inefficiently. The women had organized in secret, only other women knew, and they prevailed. Longtime resident and university graduate, Mrs. Mary Burt was the new mayor. Also elected to the town council was Mrs. Laswell, wife of the ousted mayor. Mr. Laswell could only say to the press that he was much surprised. But the same thing had happened in Amatilla, Oregon at the other end of the state four years earlier. In each case, having cleaned up the local government, the women disappeared as suddenly as they had come. The town reverted to its all male rule and women disappeared from the ranks of candidates. The women's victories may have been unusual, but the mobilization was not. Amatilla and Yonkala were the fruits of radically democratic winds that swept the Western US and its borders in the 1910s. What was radical was not always the politics or the policies, it was the belief in mass participation. And here's how you have to think about what it meant to give women the vote. Women's suffrage was the largest expansion of the electorate since the dawn of the Republic. It doubled the number of potential voters. It recognized women as autonomous political actors. So it changed their relationship to the state. While it's usually portrayed as though it was siloed off, an isolated movement, particularly in the West, sorry, yeah, particularly in the West, it often was the fruit of alliances with other movements. The women who fought for the vote saw it as part and parcel of what one of them called, quote, the greatest movement of the age, the fight for a wider democracy. With the rise of socialism, 
progressive men turn to women like those in Amatilla and Yankala as ballast against the tilt toward more radical change. Yet suffragists and socialists were often one and the same, shifting coalitions and alliances with socialists and progressives, good government forces and organized labor, along with their own improved organizing skills, garnered hard fought victories for women. In Southern California, the socialist feminist alliance swept Los Angeles into the suffrage column and so won California for women's suffrage in 1911. In our story, those new women and those theoretically disappearing Indians converge with the draft in World War I. Many Native Americans, like residents of all stripes, rushed to volunteer for military service. But when voluntary enlistment fell short of military target numbers, the government began the first round of a national draft in July of 1917. All men aged 21 to 31 had been required to register for draft the previous June. Each state had to meet a quota of enlistees based on the number registered. Most of those who were inducted were white, but in Texas, the government disproportionately drafted African-Americans. In New Mexico, the government similarly disproportionately drafted Hispanos. Across the country, it disproportionately drafted Native Americans. All Native American men of appropriate age were required to present themselves to the local draft board. But only those with citizenship were eligible for the draft. Draft boards were often flummoxed. A Sioux Nation member presented himself to the draft board. Are you an alien? The draft board member asked. No, he responded, I was born in the US. Then you're a citizen, the board member informed him. No, he responded again, I am not a citizen, I am not an alien. What are you? The board member asked. I'm an Indian, he said. I have neither the rights of an alien nor of a citizen. More than a third of Native Americans in 1917 were not US citizens. But determining citizenship status could be tricky. Myriad federal acts, guidelines about property control and competency, vague language about residence and civilized life govern granting citizenship to Indians. Not all Indians, let alone anyone else, knew for certain what their citizenship status was. Local draft boards had enormous discretion. Their practices varied wildly. Whether the lack of citizenship should have meant a higher proportion of whites would be drafted, the provost marshal found the ratio of Indian registrants inducted was twice the average of all residents. Stella Atwood found herself on just such a draft board in Riverside, California in 1917. She'd grown up in Minnesota when Dakotas still gathered nearby. With her father, she had studied native religion and society. She'd moved to Riverside at the end of the 19th century and devoted herself to working with troubled youth. In 1916, she had attended the annual convention of the Southern California District of the California Federation of Women's Clubs and heard about the state lawsuit threatening the Saboba Indians whose reservation lay near Riverside. And she turned her attention to local tribes. City officials must have known of her interest when they placed her on the draft board. As she listened to stories of Indians who came before the board, she heard of arbitrary arrests and federal control. She learned their citizenship status made them ineligible for various legal protections and representative government. And she began investigating cases and attending meetings with federal agents. Atwood was a powerful force. By 1921, she had succeeded in petitioning the National Executive Board of the General Federation of Women's Clubs to form a standing committee on Indian welfare. They elected Atwood to chair it. The General Federation of Women's Clubs was the largest women's organization of the time. It had formidable resources and skills. A high ranking club woman introduced Atwood to John Collier and within weeks Atwood had gotten the funds to hire Collier as an investigator of Indian conditions and of pending legislation at state and national levels. Atwood and the General Federation representing 2 million women hoped to cooperate with the government in a sustained effort to keep for Indians the land they still had and return to them land that had been illegally lost, as well as to improve their economic condition. Collier and the club women agreed that cultural preservation, assimilation, and greater Indian autonomy could coexist. In short, they brought into question the entire structure and rationale of US Indian policy in the West. Atwood and Collier testified in Congress in 1923 against a proposed bill that would deleteriously affect Pueblo land titles and benefit Interior Secretary Albert Fall, who got in trouble later. With the national enfranchisement of women only a few years old, Collier repeatedly invoked the power of the General Federation's 2 million voters and their expectation of remedial action. 
With varying degrees of gentility, the congressional hearings resembled a mudslinging fest. Congressmen were livid that Collier accused them of breaking faith with Indians and being in league with land grabbing interests. They accused Collier and Atwood of trying to bring down the government. Congressional committee members testily and repeatedly asked how many members the Federation really had, just who they claimed to represent, and whether they were just here on account of the salary they were paid for attempting to defeat legislation. They also impugned the integrity of Atwood, who received no salary, regarding the use of monies raised. So instead of focusing on the evidence of conditions among the Pueblos, the Congressional Committee became obsessed with the governance structure of the General Federation. It was as though Atwood and the club women were out of place. They had overstepped the proper bounds of their sphere in challenging congressional action. It was one thing to clean up their local towns. It was another thing to waltz onto the national stage. The Commissioner of Indian Affairs uh, admitted, I have thought it a great many times, this is a quote, I have thought it a great many times that there is not a Pueblo Indian in New Mexico or a woman in the state of California who could be of much assistance in working out a bill to deal with this intricate and complicated question involving the titles of the Pueblos in New Mexico. It's mind boggling. In this way, he linked Indians of both sexes and women of all races as people who had no place in congressional debates as incapable of understanding such matters. Unlike the women of Amatilla and Yankala, Atwood was not attending to strictly local affairs. And like the Indians, she was not disappearing. It's not surprising that this first women's intrusion came from the West, where women had had to vote for longer than their Eastern sisters. And the congressman would not know that there would be no avalanche of female-sponsored reform legislation on every issue under the sun to follow. They did know, and they were not wrong, that this particular crusade threatened, as future Interior Secretary Harold Ickes later claimed it had, to change the course of Indian history and Indian policy. Collier himself characterized the landmark 1934 Indian Reorganization Act as, quote, the culmination of that which Mrs. Atwood and many others had struggled for. Collier concluded, if one desired to make out a case for feminism, he could not find a better foundation for it than to contrast the action of American women toward the Indian with that of American men. Of course, the outcome of the IRA was complicated, disputed, and multifaceted. It was the product of Bill being eviscerated by Congress, the product of arrogant bureaucrats and diverse and conflicting tribal members, among other factors. As the book ends with that other Roosevelt who also planned big and rarely valued equity as much as order, it recognizes the New Deal, including the IRA, changed the literal landscape of the region, reassigning land and its uses, building enormous dams, and redirecting water and other resources. It created new structures of governance and changed the distribution of risk and reward, though not always as intended. And it faced opponents as it tried to do this, at least as skilled and just as determined to realize a different vision of a modern West. And despite and because of all these changes and all the others the book addresses through these four decades, the old myths endured, including the love affair with the idea of the self-sufficient yeoman farmer and the US West as the train on which he would best thrive. Whatever barriers white Westerners and their government erected, the West was never an isolated region without the impervious edges. Colliding diasporas filled the territory with rival claimants, asserting their rights to a piece of the dream and asserting their identity as constituent members of the region. And they had their own definitions of modernity, progress, and development, and of the boundaries of democracy itself. Thank you. I'm, I'm back. I mean, I didn't leave the whole time, as you as you know. I, as you asked, I I stayed on camera. So for those of you who are wondering, why is Kevin on camera the whole time? <laughs> Sarah and I worked it out. Uh, she yeah. wanted someone there to react off of, and uh, and I'm I'm glad I did that because it. Uh, I hope I hope I wasn't distracting in some of my no, reactions <laughs> to some some of the things because you and I even talked about some of these things in a little practice session beforehand, and then hearing the full story is even, you know, it made me react again, <laughs> even though I was already kind of prepped for <laughs> for that for that uh, reaction. Uh, but I'm going to start by saying thank you. Thank you. I know you're saying thanking us here on the screen, but thank you uh, for this kind of overview of, but also like, uh, you know, a deep dive into some of these issues that were part of the development of um, the modern U.S. West. Uh, I really like the three categories. You're going to 
stop the share. Great. So people can see us. I uh, really like the three categories that you chose to focus on. Um, and I'm going to ask you to tell us about some of the categories you didn't focus on uh, in the book, because it's a big book. Uh, but as you tell us some of the other categories, it'll give folks a chance to put something in the chat or the Q&A if they have questions. So if you do have questions, please go to the chat and the Q&A as uh, Sarah tells us a little bit about some of the other chapters in the book that we didn't focus on today. So there's, um, well, you know, some of it, I spent some time talking about the creation of the parks, both mm -hmm. in the earliest period as they were supposed to refresh overworked, over-civilized um, white Americans in the parks who didn't like running into Indians in the parks. And so you had to get rid of the Indians or put them in special roles in the parks. Um, and then of course that continues to be a thorn in the side of both the Native Americans who had been promised the use of these parks. One of the things I thought was so weird is that at some point the government decides that if a park, if, if something becomes a national park, then it no longer can belong to Indians. But they can be excluded from the park because now it's a national park. Very strange. Um, and there were and there are some funny things that went on with trying to keep deer in the park and Native Americans out of the park. Um, so that comes in. Uh, there's stuff on sexuality. Um, that uh, this determination to have a particular vision of what constituted a the ideal frontier family and mm. who should be in it. And remember, this is a region with disproportionately migrant workers. It's not only the Mexican agricultural workers, it's lumber workers and everybody else. And so they have family formations that don't look like stable, non-migrant family formations. And this becomes threatening um, to people who want to settle the land down with uh, male-headed families. And so there are issues around sexuality that come up with that. Um, there I talk a lot about vice tourism, when I talk about tourism, one of the wonderful ironic things is when the U.S. does prohibition, all those U.S. owned bars on the U.S. side of the border pick up and move to the Mexican side of the border. So the U.S. sees that Mexico is vice ridden, but it's all American owned vice ridden. <laughs> it's really the Americans are vice ridden. Um, and the difference between how we thought about Canadians who broke prohibition laws and how we thought about Mexicans who broke prohibition laws is pretty stark. Um, I have a section on um, speculating on oil that has a lot of um, ironies and humor in it. And, mm -hmm. and then I talk about general strikes in the 30s. I talk about mobilizing. I talk about um, the you know attempts to save the land by moving animals and people. And um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting that uh, you talked about uh, thing, things that we kind of hear about all the time and are still major issues today but honestly i don't i don't think i think about them enough like why are they still challenges and problems for us today the whole art agricultural system right the use of water and water as a precious resource and you've mentioned some of those other natural resources that drove the development of the west oil you know land parks trees uh, timber that whole industry wildlife um so that was really interesting to hear you, you talk about that. It can, and we're still talking about that. Uh, there's, a, there's a wonderful, also ironic moment. There are other things about World War I that come into the book. And one of them is that um, the people who owned the big lumber industries in, in the Northwest um, really had a problem with all their migrant labor organizing all the time. And they wanted to keep the IWW out. And so they blacklisted them and gave their names to the draft boards and made sure that they got into the army. The army did not want revolutionaries in the army. This was not a thing that made Pershing happy. <laughs> no. revolution in the army because you had to like build forts and you had to build you know, munition structures and stuff. And so it, it created this kind of nightmare. And he was convinced that they were all the same people. That they were all Mexican revolutionaries. They were all IWW. They were all gonna mm -hmm. completely torpedo the expeditionary force. Yeah, uh, there's a great question in the chat. And I'm going to get to it in a second uh, after I kind of, you know, I mentioned the whole you know, agricultural system and the natural resources, but the whole idea of a, the, a labor force and the, the migrant workforce being an issue and a problem and a concern and uh, it still persists today, right? So you know, I get, and this is a rhetorical question, but like, 
are we ever going to figure out these issues or is it just going to be another <laughs> hundred years of us having the same land issues, uh, human rights issues, workforce development issues? Like, do you see anything changing or has anything really changed, I guess, is the first question. And then do you see it changing further? Well, you know, if you go to Farm Bureau, um, Contemporary Farm Bureau websites, you see exactly the same kinds of arguments being made about agricultural labor that you saw then. You'd have to radically reimagine the mm -hmm. agricultural system to be able to shift what that meant. And I don't think we, I mean, I think we're pretty enterprising and imaginative as a people. I don't think we can't do it, but I think nobody has been invested in trying to find another solution to this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so fascinating. Um, there, there is a great question um, in, in the chat that asks about kind of the, the relationship or the solidarity between uh, Native Americans and Mexicans uh, at at the time was was there kind of a, a a bonding event that or were they kind of operating in their own separate worlds? Uh, how, how how did their relationship so, work? So a lot of Native American, a lot of Mexicans were Indigenous peoples. I mean, a lot of the Mexican who came through were Indigenous peoples. So that was part of the question, right? Mexican. I was mm -hmm. I got distracted by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Native Americans so some, and Mexicans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so in some sort of revolutionary movements, they're collaborating. Sometimes, on the other hand, Mexicans in Mexico were doing horrible things to indigenous peoples, just like the U.S. was to yes. our indigenous yeah. peoples. And so that could um, create friction. And it's been an issue for organizing agricultural workers, actually, when a lot of the Mexicans are um, Mexican Americans are indigenous and they're facing organizers who are Mexican Americans and their association with Mexicans is that they are horrible to indigenous peoples. It's complicated. There's a moment um, that I love when, so the Yaquis are having an uprising and Yaquis are on both sides of the border. And um, so you're trying to keep um, guns out of their hands, but nobody can tell the difference between a Yaqui and a Mexican on the U.S. side of the border. And they want to say that the Yaquis are like the people working in the mines, they're indigenous cousins, they want to say, those primitive people who are revolting in Mexico, but they're the same people. <laughs> the miners are the same people. And a lot of the mining force was indigenous, but was native in this country as well as in that country. So there were a lot of points of contact there were a lot of points of conflict around grazing, particularly in New mm. Mexico and Arizona, around who could get access to land and who um, had been on, who had the rights to the land. And often what happened is the people who really come out on top are the Anglos, like <laughs> the Mexican Americans and Native Americans don't win mm. in that sense. Right. But um, but it, often they're fighting over the same resources and they have the same communal, like in New Mexico, and they have the same communal land holding patterns that Native Americans did, yeah. some of them. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So they have the kind of same shared oppression, <laughs> the same shared, uh, you know, goals, uh, but they also are working kind of against each other because they're competing, like you said, for the same resources. It's fascinating. So what I saw briefly in the chat was about, um, we apologize to African-Americans and I didn't talk much about them, they are in the book. Um, and do we apologize to Mexican-Americans? There, um, there was a movement to get reparations for the mass deportations of the 30s. Um, it never got very far. And, and one of this is one of the things that surprises me about California because this is a total tangent, but in sterilization cases, that happened in the 70s in California, in well, on up through the 70s in California and in North Carolina. North Carolina paid reparations and made amends, and California never has. Mm. And I would have thought that would be just the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> I have to tell you. <laughs> yeah, well, someone also asks about, uh, I guess, the, the, the female vote. Uh, oh, someone asks you to write more. And do another <laughs> book on women and the and the female vote, which that is fascinating. I have a note about that too. Um, uh, Let me say one thing about the women that was really a surprise to me. So, as I said, I fell in love with the nonpartisan league. Uh, I hadn't known much about them. I felt like calling this book everything I haven't already written about the West, but um, they were totally cool. And they had they ran women candidates when nobody was running women candidates, and they did it because it gave them these women were really highly mobilized. 
and highly effective. And so the first woman to be elected to Congress, Jeanette Rankin, is a non, you know, is theoretically as close as you could get. It wasn't a party at that point, a nonpartisan league candidate. And the two women who become the first women to be in um, any sort of imperial, British imperial parliament and governing body were right across the border. And they were also nonpartisan league types. There's a lot of cross-border traffic and the nonpartisan mm -hmm. league went across the U.S.-Canadian border. So these women were, um, you know, they're part of that movement. And a lot of the, um, the WCTU, Women's Christian Temperance Union, was the other big, big elephant in the room. And they were Christian socialists in this period. And so they felt, you know, they organized, sometimes they didn't really even do anything about drink, but they would organize about, you know, labor compensation and, and all these other things. And they also would organize, they, they taught women how to run meetings. They taught women how to organize them. And these women went out and worked for the nonpartisan league and got people elected. It was just amazing. Yeah, the, the nonpartisan league is really interesting. Cool. You should write or do just write a lot about that because <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think that would be very popular, and we'd love to have you talk more about that, especially because there was that one slide where you showed where uh, women got got the got the vote, and then in, in the bottom it said like the percentage of women who actually vote in each of those states, and like the California one was like 90 to 98 percent or something crazy like that compared to some of the other states. But that was really kind of an interesting perspective. And, you know, like you said, women on the stage, like women take the stage and what happened from that point on. Um, we're, we're a little past the top of the hour, but there's two other things or maybe really one big thing that I want to talk about is how you, uh, you you had a bunch of interesting individual subjects that you talked to us about today, you know, Ishii and Atwood, and someone asks to tell us more about LBJ's kind of role now, you know, going into the, the next phase of this. Um, so we definitely want to hear what you might want to say more about LBJ, but, you know, I'm sure there are many other very fascinating individuals, characters in, in the book. Um, what, why did you choose some of the ones you chose today and who else like should we kind of just think about and get the book to find out more about? Well, I was trying, I was trying to lean into the California aspect today. So I was choosing sure. particularly characters there, but I try to t do a lot of storytelling in the book. And so then you have to have characters. And so part of it is about like, what was the story I wanted to tell and who were the characters I could pull out of that. And there were so many, one of the hardest things about this book was choosing what to leave out and, and what to put in. Less hard about what to put in than what to leave out. And and I'm not going to talk to you about all the things that aren't in the book. So the book is not what is in the book. So I, but I had thought at one point of ending the book with a contrast between Goldwater and LBJ in the 30s as they're like forming who they are. But then it just turned out that Goldwater was really too young and informed in the 30s to make him a good subject for that. Mm. But Johnson was already having the experiences working with Spanish speaking people, working in impoverished um, neighborhoods, working, you know, he had had a, a family farm failure in his own family. And he was already becoming the person who would do the great society. And then he got an opportunity working for a congressman and somebody, you know, the opportunity comes for him to first get an irrigation, he gets an irrigation project for his constituency and convinces, you know, the feds to go along with that. And then he ends it, so that launches his career, but he gets, he clearly is so grounded in his experience of the thirties and of, um, of the New Deal, in particular, and what he could make happen for people. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'd say about yeah. LBJ. Yeah, great. Well, well, we're we're almost 10, 10 minutes past the hour. Is there anything that you want to tell us? Oh, uh, you were saying that you went and looked. There's some great images that you shared, some of those illustrations. Um, and I, I'm sure people are wondering how you collected those, where are they from? Uh, and maybe you can share a little bit about that. Well, the, um, the images from the Spanish-American War were collected mm. in the OAH Magazine of History in 1998, the centennial. And there are a lot of those, and they were from various um, ones from the Detroit News, and there was one from um, the Cleveland Leader, and these were a very common way to portray what was going on, even though it was so radically inconsistent. Like, who are these people? And, uh, and I also talk about the World's Fairs of the period too, where these this got wrapped up in that. Um, some of the, you know, it was 
it's funny doing searches online for images because so I collected a lot of books that had images in them and I looked at primary sources. So the Oncolo Oregon women that come came from like a reader's digest story about those women at the time. Mm. And that I was able to have the original copy and like make a photograph of. And there was a time when you could search Google images and nobody had copyrighted their images. You could just get great things off the web. And now it's much harder. It's much harder to find images. So I need to go back to like finding images in books and, and getting permissions to do that. Um, but most of those images came from Google Image. Not all of them, but most of them came from the Google Image searches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those the illustrations are really, some of them are really great, especially the one early in, in that first section about racial yeah. and depict, uh, depictions of races for the, the new territories that were acquired. Those were just, yeah. they, they yeah. probably appeared in newspapers, I'm guessing, or yeah, pamphlets. Well, it was, yeah, that's that one was in the Detroit News and one was in the mm -hmm. Cleveland Union, which is another paper. And so, yeah, this was just a really common way of portraying this. And political cartoons in general are a great source. I looked at um, uh, this guy named Dingle, who's, who was a cartoonist for a long time. And I had a um, cartoon of his at, during the, when the stock market crashed and it's an Iowa newspaper and it's all these guys who'd been through all these other crashes. Like, why are you surprised you're gambling again? You know, <laughs> we've had yeah. this crash and that crash in the West, particularly you know, with all this stuff going on. Um, yeah. I do talk about the farmer's holiday. I mean, there's just a lot of cool stuff and, and actors in, the, in this. Yeah. Movie. I, I personally love the one of the farmer, that illustration, the color illustration with the farmer in the middle and all of that other the other stuff. You could kind of look it, at that for hours. The weirdest thing about that, so you get to the Indian policy and these, you know, these Native Americans, like you would see in Daughters of the Flower Moon or Killers of the Flower Moon, is that they're making money on oil, right? These, these Indians are getting rich, the Osage are. And it's driving the congressmen nuts. And they think, you know, these people can't naturally want to drive a Packard. They, you know, they don't really want to live in luxury. That's their gold digger wives doing that. They really, you know, they don't, they're not ready for this stuff. They have to learn to be farmers first. Mm. And somebody says to them, but nobody can make money in farming. And they say, it doesn't matter if they lose money. They have to learn to farm before they can do other stuff. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. I love it. Well, okay, so we're, we are going to wrap up now, and I'm going to wrap up by saying, you know, thank you, Sarah. This was great. It really enjoyed uh, hearing about the book and hearing you talk uh, about these three important areas of uh, development of the, the U.S. West. I'm, I'm looking forward to grabbing the book and seeing what else is in <laughs> there. Uh, and I know people out there are also interested in, in getting a copy of the book, so I will make sure that goes out to everybody who attended, some information about how to buy the book from the publisher directly. You, of course, can get it from your local bookstore. We love you to shop at your local bookstore. So please, uh, please do that. So again, thank you, Sarah, so much uh, for doing this talk for us. We really appreciate it. Um, and, and thank you, everyone out there, for attending this Book Club of California program tonight. Our, our next program is uh, a week from tonight, Monday, April 15th at 5 o'clock. It is a another virtual Zoom program, and the title is Mud, Blood, and Ghosts, Populism, Eugenics, and Spiritualism in the American West. We've got a series of uh, American West topics for you this month. Um, again, that's a virtual presentation by author and professor of English at the University of Colorado Boulder. Her name is Julie Carr. And that's one week from tonight on April 15th. You can register for that event online at bccbooks.org slash programs or using the link in the weekly programs email that you're probably getting from the Book Club of California. So thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you again, Sarah. This was great. Uh, I hope you, you so have a much. wonderful... Yeah, go ahead. Say thank you again. No, I was just <laughs> thanks so much. And it was wonderful. And it's so nice to be able to talk with people about this. Yeah, it was great working with you. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful evening and everyone out there has a wonderful evening. Be well and, and take care of yourself. Good night, everyone.